Hello and welcome to We On Live, broadcast from London. I'm Ollie Barrett and these are the headlines. North Korea fires a ballistic missile over Japan for the first time in five years, prompting Tokyo to activate its missile alert system and issue a rare warning for people to take shelter. Kremlin says Russian President Vladimir Putin will sign laws to annex four Ukrainian territories days after referendums denounced by the West as shams. Facing a fresh battle with her own MPs, UK Prime Minister Liz Truss refuses to rule out real-term benefit cuts. public inquiry into Britain's response to and handling of the COVID-19 pandemic begins. The European Parliament approves new rules introducing a single charging port for mobile phones and tablets by 2024. North Korea has fired a ballistic missile over Japan for the first time in five years. Japan has taken various safety measures in response. The US has called Pyongyang's actions dangerous and reckless. Imagine you're in a train and suddenly the alarms go off and you hear an announcement about missile firing. This is what happened to many travelers in the Sapporo region of Japan. North Korea fired a missile which fell into the Pacific Ocean after covering a distance of 4,600 kilometers. This is the first missile to be fired over Japan since 2017. Officials in Japan and South Korea say the missile is an intermediate range ballistic missile. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida immediately condemned the firing. Earlier, North Korea launched a ballistic missile that flew over Japan and is believed to have landed in the Pacific Ocean. The firing, which followed a recent series of launches by North Korea, is a reckless act and I strongly condemn it. The unexpected launch prompted Japan to take safety measures. Trains were suspended in the northern region. Many travelers were left waiting for the resumption of services. Authorities made loudspeaker announcements urging citizens to take shelter underground or inside buildings. Missile alert systems were activated. Many missiles have been launched before. I understood the situation but I had a hard time realizing what was happening until now. This time the missile flew and the alarm went off for Tokyo's southern island and Hokkaido. The launching of the J-Alert really made me aware that the danger is real and close to me. Sirens could be heard wailing in Japan's northern prefecture of Aomori. News channels across Japan covered the event. The missile firing also drew widespread condemnation. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol warned the North of a stern response. North Korea's reckless nuclear provocation will face resolute response from our military as well as our allies and the international community. The White House said in a statement that the firing is destabilizing. 
adding that it shows North Korea's blatant disregard for United Nations Security Council resolutions. Meanwhile, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, spoke to the foreign ministers of Japan and South Korea. He emphasized on America's commitment to the defense of South Korea and Japan. He also reaffirmed the importance of close trilateral cooperation to maintain stability in the region. Bureau report, we on. World is one. Well, for more, let's go live now to Chris Gilbert, who joins me from Tokyo. Chris, what's the mood like now after those alerts that were sent out to citizens? Well, things have calmed down a little bit in Tokyo. Now it's a business as usual for many people after a very rude wake-up uh, this morning with sirens and emergency alerts. Uh, people are used to receiving these uh, during earthquakes, but not so much during missiles that are flying over their head. Uh, we've just also learned in the last uh, hour or so reports that the United States and South Korea have responded to the launch by uh, conducting bombing drills in the region. Uh, South Korea had warned it would have a strong uh, show of force and response, and that may be it. Very interesting, considering that Pyongyang has, uh, has uh, suggested that the missile launch was in part in response to joint trilateral military drills by South Korea, United States, and Japan in the region. Another reason that they've uh, said the launch uh, was because it wanted to show a, a show of force about how far its new uh, missiles can reach, 4,500 kilometers is the longest ever by a North Korean missile, and Pyongyang is suggesting that, uh, the, that Guam and the U.S. military base there is now within reaching distance of its mi missile capabilities. And Chris, we've had some pretty strong words coming out of Japan, but also elsewhere in the region and, and the Americans as well. That's right. I mean, the Prime Minister Fumio Kishida came out immediately and he uh, condemned the launch. Uh, he said it was barbaric and outrageous. Uh, the Japanese government, of course, has said that North Korea's ongoing missile tests in the region are destabilizing the area. But what further is to be done about this is yet to be, is yet to be seen. Uh, South Korea is warning that the North Koreans may be preparing yet another uh, nuclear test before the end of the year. There are some significant world events events coming up, uh, China's 20th Party Congress, the U.S. midterm elections, and South Korea is expecting that the North Koreans may try yet another nuclear test in between those two events. So there are strong words all around here, but what is really, uh, what is really being shown is that tensions are really heightening in this, in this region. Uh, Japan is still very securely under America's secu uh, security umbrella. It has no military of its own. It wants to increase defense spending, and these ongo ongoing missile tests may be adding real few fuel to the government's uh, argument for doing so. Chris Gilbert, live in Tokyo. Thank you. UK Prime Minister Liz Truss is facing another potential rebellion from her own Conservative MPs. This time it's over her refusal to commit, so far anyway, to raising benefits in line with inflation. It follows a major U-turn by her government on a planned abolition of the top rate of income tax. She was forced to abandon that plan after pressure from MPs in her party who signalled they wouldn't vote for it. But Liz Truss says she'll be sticking by the rest of her economic package designed to stimulate growth. Are you enjoying being Prime Minister? I am. It's a challenging role. It's a challenging time. But what I am focused on is delivering for the British people. Is it harder than you thought? I came in with very clear expectations that this was a tough time for our country. But I'm prepared to do what it takes to get us through these difficult times, to get us through this difficult winter, and to come out stronger as a country. Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng has also agreed to bring forward publication of the government's medium-term fiscal plans 
and details of how it plans to cut government debt as a proportion of GDP. Financial markets initially took fright at the government's so-called growth plan, with the pound falling to record lows against the dollar, although it's since recovered. Graphs and grit turned this small town first into a... And for more on this, we can talk to Susanna Streeter, Senior Markets Analyst, who's joining me live now. Susanna, good to see you again. Just explain to us the difference between the two options that Liz Truss appears to be choosing between that idea of uprating benefits in line with inflation, as many of her own MPs want, or instead in line with wages. What's the difference between the two at this point? Well, when it comes to the difference in cost for families, these benefits are mainly um, aimed at working families, families who work already but receive these benefits known as universal credit to lift their wages to a certain standard. Now, if you increase uh, those benefits um, by the amount that wages are going up rather than inflation, it will cost the average family with working family with two children around $100 a month. That's uh, the cost that it would be because, of course, the benefits would not rise by so much as they would do ordinarily if they were lifted by inflation, which is currently running around double digits, 9.9 percent. And that's why it's caused such uproar, because there are other um, benefits actually that uh, uh, the Conservative Party and Liz Trust are delivering for wealthier um, earners, for example. Bankers will see their uh, cap on bonuses lifted, even though now uh, the Conservatives have dropped this 45 pence change that they were going to introduce to um, cut this rate for higher earners. There is still a lot more available for those wealthier in society than, than, than those poorer in society. And Susanna, this latest um, about turn, let's call it that, from Kwasi Kwarteng, to bring forward the date of the publication of his medium-term fiscal plan, is that designed, do we think, to reassure financial markets? It certainly is. That was one of the reasons why we saw the financial markets uh, react uh, so uh, violently, really, to what was unveiled at the mini budget because there weren't these forecasts from the independent body, the Office um, for Budget Responsibility. And that was uh, why I think we saw this extra uh, volatility really sideswipe not just equity markets, but particularly uh, bond markets and why the pan- pound fell so dramatically. Since this semi reversal of some of the tax cuts, that 45 pence rate I was telling you about, and Um, this pledge to be more transparent, bringing forward uh, this analysis. We've seen the pound lift to around a two-week high against the dollar and $1.14, and also government borrowing costs, so gilt yields fall back a little bit as well. So certainly, calm has returned. The FTSE 100 is up uh, a little bit earlier by just under 2%. So certainly, it has done the job for now of calming that volatility on financial markets. I think markets really do welcome this extra transparency. Okay, Susanna Streeter, thank you very much indeed. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has signed a decree which formally declares the prospect of any talks with Vladimir Putin impossible. Zelensky says he would be ready for dialogue with Russia, but with another Russian president. Ukrainian forces have broken through Russian defences in the south of the country. They're now expanding a rapid offensive in the east as well, seizing back territory in areas annexed by Russia. In the Ukrainian city of Kramatorsk, Russian missiles have damaged five houses. The shelling happened closer to morning. They say this was the center of the explosion. Two closed windows in our house were shattered. The roof was damaged. Our summer patio kitchen roof was shattered. The metal doors got turned out completely. In the Kharkiv region, a missile strike killed one person, 
while damaging infrastructure. The upper house of Russia's parliament has voted to approve the incorporation of four Ukrainian regions into Russia. The Federation Council unanimously ratified legislation to annexed Donetsk, Lugansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia regions. This followed a similar vote in Russia's lower house after referendums that Kiev and its allies say were illegal and won't be recognized. Russia's poor success in Ukraine speaks of the fact that people, soldiers and individuals have not affiliated with the cause. One Ukrainian pensioner has been collecting donations for Ukrainian soldiers. More than 50 years after gangrene left Frey Hori Yanchenko without legs and fingers, He's showing his fighting spirit remains intact by joining the Ukrainian resistance in occupied Kherson. These videos shared on social media in June show the 75-year-old driving his mobility cart through the city, playing the Ukrainian anthem and collecting donations for soldiers. He wears a blue striped jersey and sky blue beret from the Soviet paratroop unit in which he served. Reuters was able to verify the location of the videos, but not the date they were filmed. Every day at 9 a.m., I left on my wheelchair. And every day, I felt as if I was on a minefield. You go somewhere, and you may never come back home. But I just felt like a Ukrainian. Felt like a patriot of sorts. Yanchenko served in the Soviet Airborne Forces in the 1960s and has been trying to support Ukrainian soldiers since 2014, first organizing a benefit concert and then collecting food and other supplies. In the last six months, Yanchenko said he's raised more than $16,000. The money has been used by a Ukrainian group to buy sniper scopes, rifle accessories and clothing. Some of the money was even donated by Russian soldiers. Yanchenko says with a laugh. But after being confronted by a member of Russia's internal security service, Yanchenko knew it was time to leave Kherson, his home for 57 years. He hid for three days with a friend before making a pre-dawn crossing of the Dnipro River. You understand, I am 75 years old. I was scared that if they found my phone or laptop, or saw something of the sort. I wouldn't be able to take these challenges at this age. This is all very, very frightening. Yanchenko is now in Ukrainian-held Zaporizhia, where he continues to collect donations. Terror group Al-Shabaab has targeted the local Somali government headquarters in the Hiran region, leaving at least 20 people dead and over 30 more wounded. The Hiran governor, Ali Jeti Osman, who survived the attack, said the health minister of Hishabel state and the deputy governor of Hiran in charge of finance were among those who were killed. Officials say a first explosion occurred at the entrance gate and then a truck rushed towards the headquarters buildings and exploded. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned the attack and has further reaffirmed the UN's commitment to work with regional and other international actors supporting the people and the government on their path toward a peaceful Somalia. The attack took place after the US military carried out an airstrike on October the 1st, killing one of the top leaders of the terror group network, Al-Shabaab. According to Somalia's government, the leader was one of the co-founders of the Al-Qaeda-linked movement 
that has killed tens of thousands of people in bombings since 2006. US Africa Command has said it carried out the airstrike near Jilib, which is 230 miles southwest of Somalia's capital. The national entrance exam in India called JEE Mains that determines the fate of scores of students in the country was compromised last year. According to India's top probe agency, the CBI, a Russian man is allegedly at the center of the scam. The Central Bureau of Investigation has arrested Mikhail Shagin after he was detained at the Indira Gandhi International Airport on arrival from Kazakhstan. It's claimed that in 2021, Mikhail Shagin hacked into the software for the exam, which was provided by IT firm Tata Consultancy Services. According to authorities, Hagin hacked the TCS software in order to provide remote connectivity to control the computer terminals of candidates that were appearing for the exam. This meant teachers or coaches were able to take charge of their computers and take the exam instead of the students. According to authorities, some other foreign nationals were also involved in compromising many online examinations, including the JEE mains exams. British memorabilia company PropStore will be holding its annual live auction soon. The entertainment memorabilia up for sale this time will include items from movies and television shows, from Harry Potter to James Bond. Actually, this year is larger than ever before. Uh, last year we were at about 1,000 lots, so we've added about another 500 lots plus another day. So last year was three days, before that was two days, this year we're four days. So it's a big step up for us, which makes it a, that much more of an exciting event for us. And finally, a British artist has painted doodles all over his house. It took him two years to cover the entire property with doodles, and now he plans to live in it. I'll leave you with that story. See you tomorrow. It's just been a lifelong dream of mine to completely do to a house ever since I was really young and uh, yeah it's my, been my favourite thing to do, it's a huge uh, project but it's been totally fun and I loved it. And we think that people all around the world will be able to get a chance to see the house in, its, in as much of a form as they can through the internet, through social media because not everyone in the world would be able to visit the house anyway, so we're hoping that they can see, see it through their phones, through their computers. Maybe.